Welcome to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. I'm Michonne Boston. And I'm Tequina Boston. We're your hosts and real life sisters who binge on historical drama. We'll talk about films, fictional adaptations, and dramatic series as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. So fill your teacup or mug with your favorite sip as we explore what's fact, what's fiction, and the so what on historical drama with the Boston Sisters. I'm Michonne Boston. And I'm Tequina Boston. Welcome to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, where we talk about historical films and dramatic series as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. Listen to past episodes and sign up for our newsletter on our webpage at michonnebostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters to stay up to date on new episodes and bonus content. In this podcast, we talk about the first season of the Apple TV series, Pachinko, which premiered in 2022. Pachinko is based on Min Jin Yi's second novel, one of our five 2023 summer reads featured on our Page to Screen podcast, episode 37. You can listen to that episode on your favorite podcast platform. Our guests for this conversation about Pachinko, the book and the series, are Kat Turner and her daughter, Taylor Turner. Taylor is a biracial Korean-American writer, artist, entrepreneur, and expert thrifter. Daughter of a transracial adoptee, Taylor describes herself as an INFP personality on the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator. That's introverted, intuitive, feeling, and perceiving. She's an obsessed dog mom, proud Ateeny or fan of ATs, a South Korean pop boy band, and deep conversation enthusiast. We virtually met Taylor's mom, Kat, through the social platform Clubhouse during the pandemic and had her as a guest for a conversation about the historical South Korean drama, Mr. Sunshine. Kat Turner is a Korean adoptee trying to figure out a way to spend more time in Korea. A former broadcast journalist, Kat blogs about everything Korean, K-dramas, K-pop, K-food, and K-travel. She describes herself as a proud army, as in the South Korean boy band, BTS. She says V is her bias, and the other six members are her bias wreckers. Pachinko opens in the early 1900s when teenage Sunja, the adored daughter of a fisherman, falls for a wealthy stranger at the seashore near her home in Korea. He promises her the world, but when she discovers she's pregnant and that her lover is married, Sunja refuses to be bought. Instead, she accepts an offer of marriage from a gentle, sickly minister passing through on his way to Japan. But her decision to abandon her home and to reject her son's powerful father sets off a dramatic saga that will echo down through the generations. The series adaptation moves back and forth between the past and the fast-paced, ambitious 1980s. Richly told and profoundly moving, Pachinko is a story of love, sacrifice, ambition, and loyalty. From bustling street markets to the halls of Japan's finest universities, to the pachinko parlors of the criminal underworld, Min Jin Yi's complex and passionate characters, strong, stubborn women, devoted sisters and sons, fathers shaken by moral crisis, survive and thrive against the indifferent arc of history. Pachinko's cast features Yoon Yoo Jung, the first Asian to win the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for Minari in 2021, Portraying teenage Sunja is Kim Min-ha. The globally extolled actor-singer-model Yi Min-ho is cast as Ko Han-su, Sunja's seducer. Jin-ha plays Solomon Beck, Sunja's grandson and investment banker in the 1980s. Other cast members include No Sung-hyun as Isaac Beck, Sunja's husband, and Jung Un Chai as Kunji, Sunja's sister in law, married to Isaac's brother, Yosip, played by Han Jun Woo. 
The showrunner is So Hugh. You can watch part one of Pachinko, which features eight episodes on Apple TV. Apple announced Pachinko will have a second season. Production has wrapped. The release date for season two is still to be announced. Welcome, Taylor, and welcome back, Kat, <laughs> to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Kat and Taylor, you both read Min Jin Lee's novel, Pachinko, and watched the series. What did you like about the novel? What does the story of Koreans in Osaka, Japan, mean for you as Korean Americans? Well, I would say um, probably the the first thing that the novel it, it educated me about a period that I was unaware of, and it educated me about Zainichi Koreans, which I was also unaware of. And in fact, I don't know if you know, but um, even Koreans do not have citizenship in Japan, even if they were born in Japan. They have like something called permanent residency. So um, it was very interesting for me in a story form to learn of that time period of what was going on and then to learn about the deeper story of Zainichi Koreans. Since I, you know, as you mentioned, I was adopted. I know so little about Korean culture. So, you know, stories like this are very important in, you know, opening my world and letting me see more of the history of, of what's been going on. Yeah, I completely agree that um, growing up in school in the United States, uh, our history books did not include a lot of <laughs> um Asian history in general. And so I have grown up pretty um, uninformed, unaware of all of, you know, the Korean history and Asian history and even the relations between Korea and Japan. And so I thought it was, um, yeah, very eye opening to be able to not only learn about that time period, but also see it from a perspective of regular everyday people. Um, because I do feel that in across the board in a lot of history that we learn, um, it really does center the leaders, um, it centers men a lot. And so it was really refreshing to be able to get a perspective of people that are on these high pedestals, um, because those are like the majority of the population at those times. That's what they were experiencing. Yet we hear so many stories about the few that are at the very top. Um, so I really appreciated uh, the story from that point of view. And Taylor, you grew up in Georgia? Uh, I was born in Georgia. And then when I was a year old, um, moved up to Minneapolis and spent most of my upbringing in Minnesota. And Kat, Zanichi Koreans, that means born in Japan? Yes, they're, they're born in Japan, but their blood is, is full Korean. And in the story of Pachinko, um, you know, we learn about the fact that how mistreated Koreans were and the fact that many of them did not acknowledge their Korean blood. They actually, you know, tried to pass as Japanese because of the way they were treated. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's really important. It's interesting. I know we're talking about the, both the book and the show, but when they originally released casting news about this show, one of the things when you see Asian productions, that's very frustrating, especially in Western media, America specifically, is, is almost like any Asian will do if they need an Asian. And it doesn't matter if it's Japanese, I'll cast a Korean. If it's Chinese, I'll cast a Japanese, you know, because they all look the same. Mm. And because Pachinko is a story about identity and Korean identity and Korean identity in Japan, when they first released that, they mentioned that this Japanese actor was playing Mazazu and Soji Arai. And I was like, are you kidding? This, like, Mazazu was the one character in that story who was proudly Korean and didn't try to hide or pass as Japanese. And because it's just okay to stick an Asian in there, they put it. I don't have anything against Japanese actors, but for this particular story and this role, it was really frustrating. 
And then I happened to catch this, in, this interview came through my newsfeed from Rolling Stone. It was an interview with Soji Arai. Turns out Soji Arai, that's his stage name. And his real name is Pak So Hee. And he's Zainichi Korean. He's literally, he literally could be in real life, Sanja's grandson. He, he could be that. Right. And so I thought it was a real missed opportunity for the show, not to mention that, that literally this character is cast, in, you know, in this production and he could literally be the main character of, of the show. And it made me just feel so much better as well to know because I'm like, how could you do that? How could you put a Japanese actor in there playing a Korean, you know, which, which wasn't true. So, um, you know, like I said, I think they actually missed an opportunity not to emphasize that Soji Pak so he is actually a Zainichi Korean, which is what the story is all about. Yeah, sometimes I wonder if um, publicists or the PR and the people who are putting the information out underestimate their audiences. I mean, the audiences want to know everything. Right. Well, I'm just glad that happened to come by. I mean, I, I you know, blogged about Pachinko, and in my original one, I, I mentioned my frustration with it. After I saw that interview, I had to go put an update and say, okay, it turns out he is actually Zainichi Korean. But I mean, really, isn't the whole story of Pachinko, it really is about their identity. Right. And yeah. That affects their life in, in Japan. So I just think that's a really important, really important distinction to make. Are there any characters in the book that you personally identify with? Or who really moved you to I'm, look at the world differently? I definitely think it, I think I definitely, on certain levels related to the different women characters, I think as well, um, Solomon's character, just because he is from that like younger um, generation and had less knowledge about what all of his um family members and like ancestors before him had sacrificed in order for him to be where he was, even though where he was, was still in a difficult place of having to deal with um, some of the discrimination of being Zainichi. uh, I still think it is relatable from the standpoint of, I think, especially for me being very removed from my Korean roots and not to the point of not even knowing my biological Korean extended family, um, I have no stories or any understanding of what the lives of my fam- extended family members and ancestors looked like and like what potential sacrifices or what their lived experiences were, um, you know, that potentially I benefit from today as I'm living in like a completely different era. So yeah, definitely related to that. Yeah, I, d- I don't know if I necessarily related specifically to any character. I mean, obviously, I do share some things with uh, Sanja, and her name is pronounced Sanja, not Sunja. The Romanized way, to me, my it, ironically, my Korean name is Sunja. And so I'm like, spelled the same way as Sanja in the book. But when I met Minjin, yeah, I asked her, I said, is it Sunja or is it Sanja? Because unless you see it in Hangul, you don't really know for sure what it is, but it's Sanja, kind of like Jun Jong Kuk from BTS. It's that same Son, Sanja. Ah. So because she, you know, left Korea when she was young and, you know, grew up somewhere else, um, I relate to her from that standpoint. I don't have the heritage or the culture or the, or the knowledge or the background of my family. like like she did. Um, in the television production, they show her going back. In the book, she never, she didn't actually ever go back. Um, it's probably one of the few changes that they made in the television production that I was like, I'm, I'm okay with this. I, you know, to show kind of what it, what it would feel like to go, to go back. Um, so, um, you know, even from that standpoint, that was before, we went to Korea, right? Mm, yeah. Right. So, yeah. So then I, I went back to Korea myself, um, you know, a few months later in, in July of, of 2022. 
So for me, that was poignant to watch her, you know, see her to go back to her homeland, which obviously she was older. She was married, you know, and, and pregnant when she left. She has all these memories of it. But I, I did like that. But I feel like the characters were, you know, so many of the characters were very well developed and, and you really cared about them and you, and you wanted to know about them. And, and, uh, so I was, I, I really liked that about, about the story. Yeah. You know, um, on the podcast, we really emphasize our interest in untold stories and underrepresented people. And, um, as I, I went back and relooked at some of the, the episodes and something that came out that um, I hadn't noticed so much before a couple of times it's it talks about split lives and that made me think about things like WB Du Bois's double consciousness you know in in the black community we talk about also being cut off from our history and not knowing our ancestry and um, all the ways we're trying to reclaim that and discover it and so that was something I was I found myself identifying with with um Koreans being in Japan in a hostile culture where on one hand you're you have this public life that you have to deal with with the J- the Japanese but then there's also the life you have in your own community so that that was interesting to me but I was wondering um if you could say even more about, because you've already like started us on this, how um, the novel Pachinko provides an understanding of Koreans' history in this 20th century. Because um, as you were saying, it, it's still a situation where you cannot, even if you're born in Japan, you cannot become a Japanese citizen or be recognized as a Japanese citizen. Do you want to speak to that first? Um, yeah, I definitely think that, you know, reading about those experiences was interesting from a standpoint of when we think about, um, the way that Asian people are perceived and treated in the United States, um, there is such like a lumping together of um, everyone is this or everyone's the same or I can't tell the difference between, you know, someone who's Chinese or Japanese or Korean or Vietnamese or all of that. And um, I think what made it so interesting and probably a very good book for Americans to read is to see that Koreans are in Japan trying to blend in as Japanese, and that just speaks to the fact that a Korean can't always physically blend. And that coming from an American perspective, most people be like, wait, what the heck? How could they even tell the difference? Because they just see it as this co- complete like lump of a monolith of everyone is the sameness, and I can't tell the difference. So don't they all look the same? And it's like, no. And to the point where it was very dangerous for them to have different traits or different things that were distinctly Korean and being in Japan at that particular time. And I think when, you know, that experience is so contrasted, um, the book is very eye-opening from that standpoint in educating and just through story, which I think is the most powerful way to educate people um, because you can try, you can really empathize or sympathize with those characters um, and so, yeah, I really found that to be um, a big highlight of the book and probably one of the main reasons that I would encourage people to read about it who live outside of all of that and do potentially see kind of the whole Asian community as one in the same. Yeah, Kat. even. Go ahead, Kat. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I was going to ask you. Um, because through you, I was also introduced to Jeannie Chang, who has the Nunas Nunchi mm-hmm. um, social media presence, and she's a licensed therapist and mental health professional and speaker. And it was through her that I learned about certain uh, Korean cultural values, like Nunchi, which um, can be interpreted as emotional intelligence, or sometimes Jeannie says the ability to read the room. 
um, and Chang, which she um, kind of interprets as belongingness, and also Han, which is a kind of deep, uh, lingering sorrow. So I was interested um, in if you and uh, and Taylor can. Uh, if you were recognizing some of those kinds of cultural values or experiences as you were either, you know, reading the book or watching the series, those kinds of, of, of particular, um, the way those particular cultural experiences and values made their way into these two creative endeavors. I, I, interestingly enough, I have also learned about those terms and concepts from Jeannie because Jeannie grew up, you know, Jeannie was also born in um, Korea and, but then immigrated here when she was very young with her parents. And so, she, you know, she's a Korean American, but grew up in with her Korean family in a Korean community. So she has that knowledge and that heritage, the full knowledge and heritage of where she comes from. So I've, I've learned those terms and concepts from her as well. And I didn't, I didn't really know them before. And I can't even say that I I fully understand them. I feel like I am beginning to grasp grasp them. Um, but Nunchi, I think based on my understanding of her from what she said, I mean, that that definitely for Koreans in Japan, that, that would be a huge thing. The ability to quote read the room, or even the ability to one on one to to kind of know who you're in front of or who's around you or who you're in the midst of because it's not back in the story. It's not a safe place, um, which also kind of ties to belongingness. You know, they have their community of Zainichi Koreans where they belong. But even today, the fact that they can't have citizenship, do they really have that feeling of belongingness in Japan specifically? And even when we look at the modern portion you know solomon's story uh he still meets up with discrimination and racism as he's you know trying to do various things even even today in the 21st century in the story so um and i think the 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 sorrow the deep sorrow part um i mean that was definitely caroline kennedy you know hosted minjin lee for like a book reading and one of the things she said was, and finally, in case you think I'm not making this book sound like the fun summer read it is, I also want to congratulate Min on creating a great romantic hero in Hansu. He is Heathcliff, Percy Blakeney, Mr. Darcy, Rhett Butler, all rode into one with a gangster twist. And I literally, I'm like, what? What book was she reading? Because like, who would ever describe Pachinko as a fun read? I don't it, even think Heathcliff is a, exactly a romantic and, and example also, either. So like, Hansu is, Hansu is not a romantic hero. No. He was a predator. And, and I have a few issues even with the way he's being portrayed in the series because I feel like they're kind of trying to show us Caroline Kennedy's version. But I don't think that's what Min Jin, I don't think that's how Min Jin he wrote, her, wrote him. I don't think that's who he is, but um, you look at the 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 sorrow all through that story, even in the early days when they're talking about you know who Sanja's mom can marry, you know, and and she has to marry the town, the guy who you know I think does he limp or there's something wrong with him, and she wasn't con- you know it's, it's like the two of them weren't these great people that had these opportunities for these good matches and talk you know the you know, trying to have a baby and, you know, all the different things. There's so much sorrow. And it. we've been talking lately, and I think it's kind of one of those things that's just out there right now about generational trauma. And I think that kind of goes in there. And you see that both physically happening in Pachinko, but you also realize that whether Solomon realizes it or not, you know, the sacrifices both that his grandmother, you know, made and that his mom made and that, you know, the people before him, you know, there is, there's, there's a lot of sorrow, you know, through that and, and trauma that we're kind of realizing 
is passed through us, even if we didn't live at the same time of the people that experienced that trauma. You look at Korea overall, like obviously we're modern day, we don't really know, but you know, it's only, it's only been in the last 50, 60 years. They literally went from almost third world country to one of the industrialized nations, you know, in 50 years. And, and, you know, there, that, took a lot of chutzpah, but there's a lot of sorrow and it's not that far back, you know, when you go back and, and look at those times, even just looking at, at Sanja's life overall. Yeah. Yeah. And I see it also in some of the K-dramas I've watched where they try to wrestle with some of that past. And, um, well, I've cried through several of them <laughs> watching some of that as well. No, <laughs> yeah. no. I, I mean, I'm glad that uh, Tequina brought up Jeannie Chang and, um, her being a licensed therapist and mental health professional. Because as you're talking, I'm thinking about the series Beef, which is on Netflix. And there was a line saying how Western psychology doesn't work with Asian minds. And um, in, in, in using K-drama as a way to so explore, I mean, in, in some ways I understood that. In other ways, I was like, hmm, what do they mean by that? And yeah. That's really interesting because I, um, when I first came into contact with the concept of Nunchi, like I felt like I had found or like discovered a word that put language to an experience that I had always had. And I think that, you know, like my mom said, it is, a bit of a safety mechanism or something that, you know, people develop to protect themselves because an ability to, in the way that I've experienced it, a lot of the times when you do have a sensitivity to other people, to reading other people, to reading their energies, to reading how they're feeling about you, a lot of the times as well, like in turn, you make decisions based off that, but also there's a lot of like overcompensating that happens in turn of like reading somebody's energy and then trying to um, react accordingly so that the situation is favorable for you or more safe for you, or you are very, very sensitive to other people's energy so that you know who you can better trust or who you probably should distance yourself from. Or yeah, in any sort of situation, like being able to react to somebody's very small or intricate energies, movements, facial expressions, twitches, different things like that. I mean, back in the time could have been like a difference between life and death for them. And that can be something that's also passed down generationally. And in different ways, we are still in kind of like a, we, we aren't at the same stakes, but we're still having flight, fight or flight mode responses to things that aren't as like life or death, but all of that is still remaining within the people that have inherited this generationally. So. Yeah. And, and for, I, Oh, go ahead, Kat. I, I want to just touch a little too on what Michelle and Tate said that um, they come sometimes compare, I'm going to speak specifically about Korea because that's what I know about when I, as it, Asians go um, regarding like mental health. I have not seen beef, but um we're seeing a lot of K drama. You know, Koreans aren't known for wanting to even look at mental health issues. You know, most people would say that they're behind. You know, America and the West when it comes to that. There's a lot of face saving in Korea. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of pride and there's a lot of, you know, we need to be strong and, you know, that's probably what got them where they got in the in the fifty years. But we are, one thing I love about K-dramas is I think that it allows uh, them to put topics out into Korea of things, you know, that are changing and just maybe try to help influence a little bit. Because even the last, I don't know how many dramas that I've watched, current dramas, Dr. Slump being the most recently, there's such a focus on mental health. And in Dr. Slump, it's, it's two doctors. That's like the cream of the crop of what you can do. Go to a good college, end up a doctor. And yet they're showing that they have mental health issues. But, and it's a real journey. 
and it's a real difficult journey, but they're not that stereotypical, oh, well, you're just crazy or, you know, that kind of a thing. They're professional, smart people, and they're acknowledging that we, that our mental health is taking a toll on some of the things we've gone through. So I like seeing that. That's just one of the dramas. I mean, I feel like almost every drama I've watched for the last couple of months has had some mental health storyline. If it's not dominating, it's at least been partly in there. And um, so there's someone or people in Korea who are trying to influence and change that part of their culture and recognize the importance of our mental health and and what we go through and what we need to go through and and the help that we need with that. And what that makes me think about, and the two of you are also writers, but Nunchi is a quality writers have to have because you're actually attuned to what's going on in your environment and then you're putting it out in some form, whether it's journalism or whether it is some kind of creative endeavor. And it seems like a lot of the uh, K-drama writers are, you know, like reading the society and then giving it back to uh, and I'd say South Korean, because that's where most of the dramas are coming from, but giving it back to the society so that there's a mirror that says, hey, we need to look at this and we, and we need to like, uh, you know, uh, in some way, like just be real about what's going on and how can we heal ourselves in, the, in this process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also speaking of Nunchi, the last scene I remember from Pachinko is when Sanja is in the market. I mean, she's about to start selling kimchi and she's really noticing, okay, if I'm going to sell this, I'm going to have to really like push myself. And you see this very kind of reticent, shy woman start to approach strangers and offer them a taste. And, you know, there's this like whole transformation that you see, I hope is going to, you know, come up strongly in and, the series too. Can I but, say, Taylor, didn't that inspire you as an entrepreneur? It inspired <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, no. And I think I definitely relate to it from a standpoint of, I was very much growing up a uh, reserved, shy type of person. And throughout my life, I think just out of necessity in the same way, um, I've had to adapt and acquire skills of more extroverted skills, um, outgoing skills to be able to keep up and just, yeah, not, not be, uh, lost within like the whole crowd or like landscape. So definitely can relate to that whole, um, personality transformation or just having to push yourself in that way. Do you yeah. think so? Nobody believes it knows me now. But when I was growing up, I was painfully shy. They're like, no way. And I, I was. I mean, I almost got fired for my first job when I was in ninth grade. I was working at a place kind of like Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I was really great, you know, back there packing up the meals. And my boss was like, no, you need to get on the register. I'm like, no, no, no. I want to talk to the people. Well, just ask them how the weather is. Like, oh, I can see right out the window. Why would I ask about the weather? <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think a lot of it probably had to do with me being Korean and being the only Asian, you know, in this white society, I didn't want to bring attention to myself um, because it wasn't usually good attention. And so I wasn't going to do anything that I thought would make a fool of myself. And so, yeah, making chit chat or whatever like that. But um, so I don't know if I was technically ever an introvert or if it's just more of a situational thing, but I've just found Nobody else is going to do it for it. You have to do it for if you really want to get something done, if you really want to go where, somewhere or make things happen. For the most part, you have to do that yourself. You can't wait for other people to do it. You have to do it yourself. And that would be what, you know, Sanja had, had in the marketplace. Yeah. I think, too, um, a, a, one of my frustrations, I think, between the, the TV series and the book is that I, I feel like it. The Sanja that we saw, you know, in Korea growing up, I feel like she was a good girl and she was a rule follower. And I feel like the character they've showed us was she was kind of sassy and, you know, she looked them, you know, the Japanese in the eye and her dad's like, no, no, no. Looked I, I don't feel like that, that that was the same Sanja that Min Jin E wrote about. And I'm, I'm really not quite sure why that change was made. But I think that the way the character as written 
Um, I, I think it's a, there's a reason why she was written that way and it shows the journey and it changes that journey as well because as you said, it maybe wasn't naturally what she wanted to do in that market, but she knew if she was going to survive, she would have to do it. And we know that having seen her travel from a young girl as a good girl rule follower and all of the different things that she's gone through, um, that that makes that really an important part of, of the character that Minjin E had developed for us. Yeah. And the beauty of the book is seeing the women in that story do things. You know, sometimes the husbands weren't, you know, keen on it but they're like we have to survive here so. they say you want to eat don't you <laughs> i i say that about you know as the more i see of korea is i realize that it is a um a patriarchal society but i'm like i think the women actually really run things yes they know that there's a certain thing that if they do it they're maybe gonna in the old days and maybe even today too get a backhand or whatever be, you know but but I, it, a lot of the men, I think in some ways they are intimidated and in fear of their, you know, wives because they, you know, they, they are strong, they're strong women and I'm a strong woman. I remember even when I first met, um, connected with other Korean adoptees and I literally said, I literally asked the room, I said, I just want to know, are any of you other women in here strong willed? And like everybody, I mean, like we literally, we're all SWAS, S-W-A-W, strong-willed Asian women. And, and, in, and I thought to myself, oh, well, it's a really good thing I didn't grow up in Korea because I would not have been accepted that way. But then when I see the things in Korea, like what they show us in K-dramas, I'm like, oh no, it's genetic. Yeah, <laughs> I, I come by it naturally, you know? So, you know, that, that gives me hope too for where women will, you know, be able to go even when we look at the, you know, right now they're, their fear and worry over their birth rate. Oh yeah. But you need women to be be willing to say, we'll have the kids. And right now they're like, yeah, no, no, I don't, I, you know? So it's like, unless you're going to give us, you know, let us be able to have children and also have a real life and not just be, you know, sacrifice our whole life to have those kids. Um, you know, it, it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. But I, I think that, um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting journey. Well, speaking of interesting journeys, um, Eamon Ho generally plays kind of like the, you know, the lead, you know, he's the, usually he's uh, part of the lead couple or he's the lead role. And usually it's a little bit more like heroic or romantic. Uh, not so much in, in uh, <laughs> Pachinko. So, um, Taylor, I know your mom is a fan of Lee Min Ho, but how uh, did you feel about him taking on a role which feels a little bit uncharacteristic of the kind of roles we see him in in the South Korean dramas? Um, yeah, I was definitely interested to see what he was going to do with it or what they were going to write for him because I think it always is great to be able to see an actor who maybe to a certain extent has been a little bit typecast in, you know, previous roles or like you said, kind of gets the same heroic lead, good guy type of person. Um, I think it would be very satisfying as an actor to have the opportunity to show a more dynamic, multidimensional facet to one's skills and abilities and so i think that was kind of what i went into it um mostly curious about and looking forward to is seeing okay you know does he have this ability to kind of shape shift a little as far as his acting is concerned um into this different type of character and and um having been somebody that it takes on those more beloved roles can he bring to the table sort of the I guess the grit that's required for this particular character. And Kat, did he have the grit as Kohan Su? Do you think he, he transformed from the usual male lead to the antagonist? Yeah, I, I have a little bit different ex, uh, perspective on Eamon Hope period, you know, in the K dramatics room, uh, you know, my, uh, the, lovely admins and I were used to joke with each other because I'm like, do not diss my Eamon Ho, you know, because they're, you know, 
And there you'll find out people who love or hate different different actors, right? Yeah. And I and I I don't think that he's the same in every single role. I remember my first drama for him was The King Eternal Monarch. And I just remember his look being so unusual for a Korean. I'd never seen a Korean that even looked like that. And then, you know, it took me down the rabbit hole and I watched um, Boys Over Flowers. And I literally kept going, this is the same guy. This is the same. I'm just like, it doesn't seem like I'm like, okay, they're saying it's the same guy. I'm looking at pictures. I'm like, this is the same guy. Um, so I, I do see the, the different characters. He's, he can be very comedic, you know, in Legend of the Blue Sea. He and <laughs> Jun Ji Hyun, I mean, their chemistry and their timing with each other as far as, you know, being comedic with each other was just like off the charts. Um, and then in the King Eternal Monarch, you have some comedic things, but then when he needs to have that regal look of the king or whatever, you know, that would come across. Probably my favorite drama, which a lot of people can't see because it's just not out there on regular streaming platforms, is City Hunter, which has a ton of action. And he did all his own stunts in that. So I have seen many facets of him. Yes, he does usually tend to play, quote, the good guy. In City Hunter, it's a little questionable. He's balancing between this his father wanting him to take revenge and him like, yeah, I need to take revenge, but I want to do it in a different way than what my father would like. So with that perspective going in and also worried that because he's the big star, he's the one that in America, I don't know how many people would turn into into the show because it's a full Asian cast, something that we ne- you know rarely, rarely ever see. And, and primarily Koreans with Japanese because of where the story is. Um, so I do think that casting him was a definite, they needed the K-drama audience. They needed to, to know that they had that foundation, that base and the people that were following him. Um, I was a little afraid of what, at what they were going to do to Kohansu if they were going to turn him because he's not likable in the book. As we've said at the beginning, he's not likable. He's not romantic. He is not a hero. He is a predator. He, you know, an abuser, you know, just because you do some nice things for people doesn't make you a hero or make you romantic, right? Um, so there were parts of him that I, I, I do think he played the character well um, in the series, and we do see a darker side of, of that. I was not a fan of the solo episode that was just him. I didn't. It was a story that wasn't in the book, and the, the writers of the series decided to make up his past. In my opinion, they don't. They didn't have the right to do that. It's Min Jin's character, and um, you know when you look at the fact that uh, she did start out working together for the production, and then they split ways. I mean, ah, you want, oh, if, is that the backstory? We don't. Yeah, she she doesn't say anything out there, but when you, I mean, in some, I feel like when you look at the series. You, I mean, I, it, you know why she, you know why she split ways. And so to me, it was not very respectful of her to, to take his backstory because I also felt the backstory was trying to manipulate us for us to feel sorry for him. Oh, look what happened to him when he was a teenager and he went through this, when was it an earthquake or a bomb or, you the know, earthquake, I yeah. now like as if we should then give him a pass for the current Kohan Su that he is like, no, just leave him as the. Yes, tell us some, give us the backstory that Min Jin Yee did. Because the other thing is, Pachinko is not the Kohansu story. And I, that is probably another frustration is I do feel that they focus on Eamon Ho and Kohansu a little too much. He is, he's at the beginning of the book and he disappears for a long time. And then he comes in a little snippet here, but he is not a major focus of the, of the story. So, um, so yeah, I think he did well. I don't think it's this huge groundbreaking different role that everybody's saying. I'm just like, I, it, what he did in that didn't surprise me. And to me, it doesn't feel different. Meaning, I, I feel like I've seen that part of him. I feel I've seen, you know, the more range from him and the things that I have seen where other people are like, oh no, he just always plays the same old character over and over. So for me, I already had a more positive, probably outlook on who he was and what he was portraying before. But I do think he's done well with what he's given. Just wasn't real thrilled with that individual episode because I also thought 
his hair and his, why, why is he the only guy running around in a kimono? Everybody else is in Western clothes, but he's in a kimono. And then he has this, I'm like, yes, I know that when he was in the airs and he was probably like 29, he played a, a high school student, but even home now to me, he did not look like a teenager. I'm like, no, you didn't, he didn't carry that. So for me, all the way around, I just, that particular part, I was not, I, I, I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you so. Yeah, there were so many departures from the book in the series, and that was one that kind of stuck out for me as well, um, Kohan Su, making it more of a complicated love story than, as you said, Predator. And I think I think controller. It, controller. I think people we're so accustomed to back to Caroline Kennedy's interpretation of the book, the Mr. Darcy, someone with money, someone with power. Um, who can turn things around for people. And I think um, in some ways the series kind of tapped into that romanticism instead of the reality that often these people, if you read the book that the series The Swans is based on, are controllers and want to have things their way. I mean, Sanja, to her credit, when he said, I'm married, I'm not leaving my wife, but you can be, as to put it bluntly, my piece on the side, and I'll put you up in a nice house, etc. That she said no, that's unacceptable. Is it something the series is telling us about love that the book was warning us about? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. And I think that they did. I remember that there was like a scene where I feel like he kind of roughhoused her in the in the television series. Um, which again, I don't think was in the in the actual book itself. Um, I do remember in other ways him exerting his power dynamic over her, whether it was in the very beginning when there's this, you know, um, power dynamic of him being more worldly and her being this, you know, more innocent, just lived in this small town her whole life, um, didn't know. Like, I'm pretty sure in the book, like, they didn't even, she didn't even really know what sex was or what was happening to her or, like, what was going on. Like, that was how naive she was. Um, And I do think, like, he, you know, inappropriately asserted himself and used his power dynamic in the book in many different ways. But I don't think it was, at least in the way the book was portrayed, in that kind of cliche, like, violently kind of roughhousing you around, um, like, they had a scene that I recall from the television series, but I do think it like kind of does a bit of a disservice when it, you are, you know, pulling out these cliches rather than being able to keep a focus on some of these more insidious ways in which um, specifically men can, you know, whatever is considered like a romantic or relationship or whatever type of a thing. Um, I think like some of those smaller ways those stories need to be amplified and highlighted so that people in real life can kind of recognize when those things are happening to them because if you overshadow it with this more dramatic and and flashy kind of um stereotype then it's you know we have quite a bit of that already and people are aware of that but some of this more subtle stuff um that isn't talked about then kind of gets put on the back seat and then people don't recognize it as easily when it is happening to them. So, um, yeah, I do feel like there was a bit of a disservice on there. And again, I felt like Min Jinny's, like purpose in writing this was to highlight not only the commoner people, which is why all the characters were in the story, but I think it was to take it a step further and to highlight women's stories. And so for the series, the television series, to, again, we were back to very much highlighting Kohan Su, very much highlighting Solomon, It was like, oh, this feels very familiar, doesn't it? You've been enjoying Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, a podcast where we talk about historical drama series and films as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. Visit our webpage at michonbostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters. Share this podcast. Join our historical drama community by signing up for our newsletter to stay up to date on future episodes and bonus content. Now, back to our podcast conversation. It's interesting. I, I, 
at the point now where when a series or film is made based on a book, particularly a book I love, I just treat them like they're two separate uh, creations so that hopefully I won't be disappointed. But I do remember an instance where there was a movie I saw first, read the book, and was like, thank God they didn't follow the book, because the <laughs> book was, it was, it, okay, my favorite epic back in the day, Ben-Hur. Love the movie, right? Could not get through the book at all. It's one of those 800-page Victorian novels. <laughs> And I was said, okay, this was an instance where actually the film was better than the book. Are there any uh, pieces in the TV series that while there were departures, you thought they added something positive to the story? See, for me, that rice scene worked. When um, Sonja went to the lady's house and Solomon was trying to warm her up to the idea of selling her property to the bank and where she ate. Now, maybe it was, it worked because you had the right actress <laughs> in the scene. Oh, yes. Sometimes it's, it's Great the right, actresses. Yeah. it's the right actress. The, the, the issue that I would have with that, the scene itself, like you said, you know, probably it gave some insight that we otherwise wouldn't have had, but into Korean culture, right? And, and the role that the rice played in that particular scene. But when you look at overall, Solomon was turned into basically Mosazu. Solomon was Solomon was not. He didn't even come in till what three quarters of the way into the book. And he, you know, if you recall, he did not sell that. He did not meet that woman. He did not sell that house. That wasn't him. He none of that was him. None of that stuff happened to him. We don't know what happened to him at the you know, the office and where he worked. None of that happened to him. Now, could that actually happen to a Korean today? It could, but it, it wasn't Solomon's story. And in fact, probably even one of the initial things where they had Solomon or uh, Solomon stealing stuff in the convenience store. And so Mazazu sends him to the United States, right? That didn't happen. In fact, Solomon paid for the things that Hannah stole. stole. And he was not sent to that. Masazu was not like a rebellious to that de- degree of what the Solomon character is in the show, but he had more of that nature of him. And I think it it's the changes that they made, you know, it's like the fact that this series was made is like that. It's just, it doesn't happen very often in Western, specifically American media, where you get a cast that's full Asian like that. So it's so hard. It's, I'm, I'm a little torn because on one hand, I want to support that because I want other projects to get green lit that feature people that look like me in America and for our stories to be told. But on the other hand, when you take such significant things and change them so much, you said sometimes, you know, sometimes usually you don't like the, the movie as well, or in that one, you're like, oh, this is better. You view them as two separate things. The thing of it is, is Pachinko is a best-selling book. Even President Obama recommended it. It's best-selling. There's a reason it was best-selling. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to like it, but there is a reason that it's best-selling. And for me, it gives me a little insight at least you can make some, you know, guesses as far as when you're going to change that story so significantly, why the original author of that story is no longer a part of that production that was put out. And I just find when you look at Korean culture overall and the respect that's given to, you know, the elders and the people that come before you, that includes Min Jin Yi and her production. But do you know what? Every sing have did you ever hear anything? Do we ever hear anything when they don't mention based on the best selling book of Pachinko, Pachinko, Pachinko? But zero interviews, zero comments, nothing from the author. That's a red flag to me. And it, that part of it disappoints me that you had a Korean American production company that changed a story like that so much. It's kind of like 
writing the coattails of the success of the book, but we're going to tell you a little different story because, you know, da da da. Do I think the book was perfect? Or are there some things I've like, oh, why'd you do that? Yep, I had that. We do on all books, right? But that was her choice because she was the author. One of my favorite people that I follow and like to read is Jaha Kim. Jaha Kim. She's a freelance journalist and she's Korean. And um, she, was, she wrote a review, which I highly recommend people to look up. Again, Jaha Kim. And if you just put Jaha Kim and Pachinko, it will pop up. But I want to just read a little thing in there. You know, she said, she said, outlets like the Los Angeles Times describe it as stunning and being so good that it makes the competition look bad. A CNN reviewer promises that Pachinko is a sweeping family saga that earns your tears. And based on 52 critics' reviews, it received a 9.2 slash 10 rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It's the kind of series that screams Emmy nominations. She goes on to say, so why am I so ambivalent about this extravaganza that critics are almost universally raving about? Truth be told, I feel almost guilty for not being 100% in love with this Apple TV Plus series, which runs through April 29th. Asian Americans, much less Korean Americans, have had almost no representation in the arts until recent years. And here's this series, which is spearheaded by Korean American showrunner Su Hu, whose source material is the best selling novel of the same name by Korean American author Min Jin Lee. It's a time to celebrate Korean American creativity, right? And it's the same thing with me. I've had this blog post about the series sitting in my thing. I can't finish it. And I, it's like, can I, should I not put it out? Because should I criticize it? Should I say how I feel on some of those issues? Let's ask Taylor that question. Taylor, what do you feel about criticizing? Well, because we got social media now and everybody's a critic these days um, or has access to a platform to put their thoughts to, to words. What do you think? about this um, dilemma. Is it a dilemma? Yeah, it definitely is a dilemma. I felt similarly when I read the book and then watched the series and because I had very high hopes for the, se- the series going into it, I was very excited for having more representation. Um, I do think that if, I, if like push comes to shove, my stance on it is that yes, we should criticize. Um, I do think that it is unfortunate that we don't have as much um, media and representation to pull from. And I do think a lot of like white Western media entertainment and art, it's more easily able to be criticized even by like the white community because there is so much of it. So there's not really like a threat involved there. It's like, well, something else is going to come out and it doesn't threaten our ability to get other, other, um, shows like green lighted and stuff like that but at the same time i think that despite that lack of representation and ability i still think that as a community that we should still hold ourselves to the highest standard um and i don't think that you know in the same way that like not all white media is good and you know life-changing and deep and um i think that Asian media is allowed to be that too. It's everything is allowed to not be a home run, and that shouldn't negate from somebody being able to get another opportunity because one thing didn't hit it hit it out of the park, right? And so, yeah, we should be able to openly be able to criticize it without fear that that means that like nothing is going to be greenlit again in the future. Um, because I do think that it ultimately helps, you know, better content as a whole if we can just give constructive criticism or have a dialogue about it and discuss things. And it's, it doesn't even have to be a, well, this whole thing was trash. Cause you know, looking at it in such a black and white term is also unfair as well. But um, yeah, I definitely am on the side of we should have the safety and ability to, to do that, like within our community and not feel like our critique is Threatening or bringing down opportunities for our other fellow Korean Americans. Or betrayal. Yeah. And, and believe me, we have lived through those conversations <laughs> for many, many years. Yeah. Right. Oh, boy. I would say the good news is there are so many ways to distribute content these days. And that the high profile 
um, book that became this series introduced new faces and talents to American audiences. And sometimes it becomes the platform for these talents to get for some new stuff to happen and new content. So that's what I would say is the good news, but we'll see what, and they have a second season. So. Right. And like I said, my criticism doesn't mean that I don't think anybody should watch the the show or that it was all bad. I mean, the cinematography was stunning. And And there's good acting in it too. Yeah. I loved how they took the dialogue and we had English, Korean, and Japanese. I mean, that I feel was kind of groundbreaking. And the fact that, you know, Sue Hugh, the showrunner, you know, wanted, wanted to do that. I thought that was really cool. Um, and, and I felt it, you know, re- highlighted what we were seeing the story more to be able to see those three different languages going on at the same time. So yeah. And that, the, you know, there are, uh, you know, Yunya Jun, I was just so thrilled when I found out that, you know, she was, uh, Yunya Jung, I should say, that she was going to, you know, be in this series. Um, so, um, yeah, definitely, it's it's not a, it's not it's not a, like, oh, it's a total loss. Let's bash it. No, it's not like that. But it's just, but there are some things there that it it, it makes you question. Did did it need to be done? Would would it have even? Uh, I didn't read that last the last little thing that Jaha Kim had said, and she said, but to paraphrase. Paraphrase the late Roger Ebert's review of Memoirs of a Geisha. The more you know about E's novel, the less you will appreciate this series. Not because it isn't a word-for-word reenactment of her storytelling. Televised adaptions rarely are. But because you know how great it could have been if the creatives opted for a more linear storyline. Mm. So I think if you haven't read the book, you probably will enjoy it more than if you had read the book. And if you have read the book, it's very hard for you to ignore some of those just blatant things that are out there. So, so maybe even a recommendation, watch the series first and read the book, read the book after the fact, you know, and then get filled in and know what really, what really happened. I would definitely say, and I say this no matter what, always read the book, always read the book, no matter, no matter what. Um, Cause there are, there's information there that you're even in your most favorite, you know, production of a story to, to film there's things in the book that you just can't put on screen that you don't get. So always read the book. Yeah. And I did hear that feedback from people that had never read the book, that the series was a lot more effective and they had a lot more positive reaction to the televised series if they had not read the book. So I think on its own, it clearly has an ability kind of stand alone. It is just when the comparison comes into play that I think that people who really found, um, a strong connection to the book, maybe feel a little bit disappointed. Yeah, and I have read books because I've seen a film or a series first. Um, and actually, often it's more rewarding to do that <laughs> because once you once a book enters your heart, it's Crazy, very Crazy was like that for me, and I loved that movie because it was the first. It was that was the very first thing that we came out with an all Asian cast produced it by, you know, Western media, right? But then when you read the book and you see how deep it is, like, oh my gosh, wow. I looked at Crazy Rich Asians almost as a as a comedy. The book is anything but a comedy, you know, again, really delves into identity, you know, of the various Asian characters that are in there. Yeah. So yeah, it gave me so much more of the backstory. So yeah, I, I think ultimately watch the series before you read the book. But then definitely read the book because you really should know the story that Min Jin E meant for it to be and yeah. the character the way they were written, as written. Now, did y'all watch the series together or, or separately? Well, I actually had early access to it, so I watched it um, before it uh, all this all the series premiered, and then um, I rewatched it with Taylor because Taylor only read the book. Right, like I'm literally finish the book. The series is going to be on. The series is going to finish the book. It was good to rewatch it together from my perspective because it had been a while since I read the book, and I'm like, am I remembering this wrong? Am I? And I didn't tell her anything because I didn't want to influence what she saw. But when she started going, "What? Why are they doing that? Wait, that's oh good. It's not just me." 
you know, but there were things that she, she remembered more from the book. Oh, because it was so much more fresh in my memory at the time because I had just literally finished it in anticipation of the television right. series. And I am the type of person, unfortunately, even given that advice to like watch the series first and read the book, I cannot hold my attention span if I if I've watched the series first. So like I have to, and that's why I was just trying to go as quickly as humanly possible to like get through this book because I knew that if the series started and I watched it, that it, I would have a lot harder time actually like pushing myself to get through the novel. So um, yeah, I mean, as as maybe as much of like a negative effect as that particular order had, I'm so glad that I did that. Yeah, yeah. I started the series and then I stopped and I read the book and then I came back to the series. So, so that's wow. option three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something about as you were watching the series that made you stop? Well, um, it was a book I always wanted to read anyway, because I believe I read her first novel. Food for Food Millionaires, yeah. And I thought her, Pachinko was definitely growth. I saw growth in the writing and the storytelling. So as a writer, Taylor, you and I, and Kat, you too, you write. It's for me, it's the writing. It's always the writing. And I can appreciate the storytelling through the other medium too. But um, I was just very happy to see how, how the author has grown and matured as a writer. And it was just an epic, epic novel that I think should be on school book lists. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah, because we, you learn a lot of history through it as well. So. Absolutely. Well, and and um, young people and everyone in general, we are able to absorb history and remember it and have it resonate with us when it's told through story, yeah, and not through facts in a t in a history textbook. So I think it can be very effective for students mm -hmm. to be able to take it in that way from that method. It's interesting you say that because I had no interest in history until I took theater history, where the whole point was. Oh, this technology, this is how it went on the stage. Oh, this is what was going on in society. And that's why they wrote this play this way. And it was like, oh, history can be interesting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have an emotional connection to it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So you two, Kat and Taylor, what do you want to see in the second series of Pachinko? Since we don't know what's in it. It's wrapped it's we don't know when it's going to come out, but what are you hoping to see? It <laughs> yeah, I, I was really disappointed. I feel like Mazazu is basically Sanja's driver. Like that's all we see of them. We, they don't even tell us in the show in this first season why it's called Pachinko. It's Pachinko because of Mazazu. That's yeah. why they're you know. And um, I have a friend who put a theory out. I I actually think it would be a great theory because. And there, because we did not see Noah in this, except for just very briefly as a very little boy. But the story, the story revolves around Noah. That is what took Sanja to Japan is because she was pregnant with Noah, right? Mm -hmm. My, and it's like, well, what more are they going to do for um, Imen Ho and Kohan Su, but make more fake story up, right? And they said, maybe Imen Ho is going to play younger Noah. And I said, no, that idea, I, because they're, because they say he looks like his dad. Yeah. They say no, through the book, she right. says, yeah, like they looks like head. Kohan Su. So wouldn't that be, I mean, if they weren't thinking of it, I hope they heard my friend's theory and I hope they do that. I mean, wouldn't that, what a great way to put him into the story, give him a dual character to play, which is, those are always great if the, if you develop those characters. And then he and he would be age appropriate for playing, you know, um, Noah from from college on, which is, you know, a, a big part of that story and and what what happened when he, you know, left and you know, came, you know, left once he found out Kwan was his father. So I would love to, I would love to see that because that doesn't require them to make Kohan Su somebody he wasn't, and so it would be a cool way to stuff, tell a story. But Masazu as well, I I, I think. Because really, truly, there's no pachinko without Masazu. Yeah, that's right. 
in the title. He is the one that got the family into that. Stop relegating him as Sanja's driver and give him some, let's see his, let's see his real story, you know, play out. Because even Soji Urai, Pak Sohi, is not as old as he is portrayed in the, as Mosazu in, in the current day. So if they take off the aging makeup, he literally could play Masazu same time. Like Noah, if Eamon Ho played um, Noah, the two of them are probably not that far. They're probably similar in age in real life. So uh, wouldn't that be cool if they let Musazu play young Musazu without the makeup and then brought Eamon Ho to play Noah because he looks so much like Ko, his father, Kohan. So I think that would be very cool. And I want to see more of, I do, I want to see more of Sanja and uh, Sanja and obviously, and actually I really want to see a little less of Solomon. I, I, I want them to, uh, I, you know, I, I feel like it's kind of like, oh, we got to see the young glamorous, you know, whatever. I, if you recall, remember, you know, his white boss or coworker or whoever it is. Yeah. We know more of his backstory than we do of Mosazu's backstory. And that guy wasn't even in the book. But remember, he went on and on about, you know, when they, like, that's, that's, we know more about a white character than we do about Mosazu. I mean, they explained, you know, he talked when he thought, was he getting fired? Do you remember the scene, the, the white, the white, I don't, was it his boss? Do either of you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And he's explaining and talking about his wife or being sad and da 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 And I'm just like, yeah, I'm just like, yeah, we know. I think you were actually the one that even first said that. And we're, we're always, she's my K-drama buddy. We watched K-dramas. Last night we sat down to watch K-drama. <laughs> and we, we had 23 minutes left of an episode. We got through the 23 minutes. We got maybe through 20 minutes of the next episode. We just kept pausing it so much. And at 6 a.m., we're like, we got that podcast to do. You need to go home. <laughs> we just keep pausing and, pausing and talking. And so we did that. We did that with Pachinko as well. And I think she's the one that said, yeah, we know more about the, this white guy than we do Mosazu. So I want to know, I want to know more about those other characters that had a really strong impact in the actual story. And I want it to be uh, more true to, to the way they were written. What about you, Taylor? Yeah, I mean, I I do really want to see more of Sanja's story. Um, obviously, I'm very much a proponent of them uh, centering the women's stories and you know the impact that they had during that time period, the sacrifices that they made, um, and. I just think, I do think it is so vitally important on even just like a bigger scale as far as um, telling women's stories, because I do think that um, those voices just get so lost and, uh, and, and especially when it comes to patriarchy and just the, the way that, you know, women aren't really seen as having big contributions or having value or, you know, because even like within like the roles that women oftentimes have been relegated into, into society, it's not even been that the, those roles haven't been important or ha- had a huge impact on society or um, cause even my mom and I were talking uh, about like motherhood and how huge like a role and everybody will always tell, Oh, mothers have the hardest job. Blah, 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 blah. But, a lot of the times, like like when people become mothers, they don't really get seen as individuals anymore. Um, and and I do think that it is a lot of lip service that happens with some of these things that oh well we will just you know say how great this is, but then like the actions and like the way that we treat women, it tells a whole different story. And so I just think that you know there almost needs to be a bit of an overcompensation happening with. Um, centering women's stories so that we can kind of try in some small way to rebalance what has happened as far as like society's mind is like a whole around this. And I, you know, I also feel that way about, you know, any sort of like underrepresented story as well. Um, but yeah, so I think that that is something that I would love to see 
more in like the second seasons because it can have a huge impact. Yeah, let's hear it for the women. Now we have come to our lightning round for the podcast. And Taylor, this will be your first lightning round. Uh, This is where we ask our guests questions that are themed for the podcast. Kat, I want to revisit your answers to the questions from 2022. Looks like we're doing a little time traveling right here, right now, um, when we were talking about the South Korean drama, Mr. Sunshine, which is currently still playing on Netflix. So let's um, review what you said, Kat, to the question of if you could go back in time, where would you go and why? For me, and this is literally, I've just been thinking about it. It's not something that I would have even maybe said to you a year ago, but I would go back to... Um, the time when I was a baby and when my mom gave me up, because I would, I want to know who she is and what, what was behind that, what was behind that decision. I want to know what the situation was. So before we ask Taylor the question, Kat, has anything changed for you since you visited South Korea after that podcast recording? Definitely things have changed for me. Um, my my answer to that as I was thinking, I didn't, I didn't even remember you guys asking me that. And I didn't know what I said. So when I heard that, I'm like, Oh, really? So it's not that I wouldn't still want to do that. But I think more so now, I would maybe want to go back to the 70s and see, you know, it was see where Korea was at. And also I've, there've been a lot of narratives that adoptees are told as far as what our lives would have been like had we remained in Korea. And some of them have turned out to definitely be myths and urban legends. And um, sometimes when Taylor and I are watching K-dramas, I'll stop it. And I'll be like, you know, wonder what it have been like, what would it have been like if I had I grown up there? So I think I would maybe choose to go back in the seventies during that that era to to see what life would have been you know like for me in Korea at that at that time and Taylor here is, here's the question again for you if you could travel back in time where would you go and why um I definitely think after hearing my mom's recorded answer it had really made me think and um, I think I would go back in time to like my upbringing, whether it's like childhood through like teenage years and um, knowing what I know now about Korea and being able to have like visited and gone there more earlier, like, I, you know, throughout my upbringing and like my life, being able to like go there and travel there and um, find uh, inspiration to even like learn the language and all of that a lot earlier in life. I think visiting during that time period would have, you know, given me a lot of enrichment in my life. Um, that I, I'm luckily now discovering later in life, but I think it would definitely have been a different situation if it had been earlier or like throughout my life as well. And there, I mean, there's a ton of reasons, you know, like being mixed or there, there's underlying layers to all of like the reasoning behind it. But yeah, that's what I would go back to. So our second question is our time capsule question. And Kat, when you answered our time capsule question in 2022, the three items you said you would put in your time capsule were something from 9-11 because it was so significant in your life a Stacey Abrams for Governor t-shirt and your Asians for Osaf and Warnock and your blanket with your bias V for BTS. So those are your, your time capsule <laughs> pieces. So Taylor, your turn. What three items would you put in a time capsule that represent your history and the times you've lived through? Oh man, that is so funny to think about some of those um, Korean items that you put into the capsule. I never really thought about that. Um, 
hmm, that would really make me want to maybe put an AT site in the capsule. But I think outside of that to represent maybe like the larger time period as a whole, I would probably do like iPhone um, overhead projector that we would often have in schools that are probably obsolete today and a disposable plastic water bottle. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Can I change my time capsule? You want oh, to change? Sure. I definitely wanted, I, I, again, I didn't remember. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me about putting my BTS blanket in there because <laughs> it was it was like most current. First of all, I just have to tell you, you guys need to allow us more than three items. Like, come on, that's not enough. <laughs> but uh, when, when we were talking about this last night and I was thinking about it, I now I would put in my um, passport when I came to Korea as a baby. And then I would put in, I need two pictures to go in there. Um, and that counts as one item. And that's a class picture. Um, you know how you have the class picture and all the students are there and a family picture because I need people to see what it was like for me and who I grew up um, amongst. So that would, that would, you know, I'd like said, so I'm generally, you know, the only other Asian except for my adopted Korean, Korean brother as well. So I would put those two pictures in my family picture because, uh, my family is multicultural as in I had five white siblings who were biological to my parents, another brother who was Korean adopted, and then two siblings who are mixed, part black, part white. Um, and then as a class picture, it would be my little Asian face with all the white, all the white kids. And then the, and then the, um, the last thing would be, I showed you this tattoo earlier, but it would be the stamp. We had a family stamp made by the um, gentleman in Korea is the only one who's been designated as the master craftsman when it comes to making seals. Mm. Seals is that stamp they put on to authenticate that that's really their signature. And um, uh, so I would put that in because it has my name on it. It was made in Korea by Korean. And a gentleman who interviewed him for one of the Korean newspapers um, said something about when Che Byung Hun makes your only mark in the world. And for me, because I just have very little history about myself, that I, it, like, it is, it's my one and only mark in the world. So I would include that as well. Okay. So thank you for joining us to, for, in this conversation about Pachinko. And we're looking forward to seeing what happens in the second series, who gets cast, who's going to be playing Noah, and um, hopefully we'll hear from Apple TV soon about a date. And more women. And more women's stories. So Series 1 of Pachinko, featuring Hyun Young Jung and Yi Min Ho, is streaming on Apple TV with a subscription. Min Jun Lee's novel Pachinko is available in our affiliate bookstore. Go to our website, click on the link, and buy a book. Your purchases support production of this podcast and independent booksellers in your community. We invite you to share this episode of Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters with someone you know who would enjoy the conversation. Subscribe to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters and enjoy past episodes wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on future episodes and bonus content. You can write us at podcast at michonbostongroup.com. Like and share historical drama with the Boston Sisters on your social media. This is Michonne Boston. And this is Tequina Boston. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, a podcast about historical films and series dramas. Visit our webpage at michonbostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters. Tell us what historical dramas you're watching. Who knows? We may do a show about it. Sign up for our newsletter, subscribe to the podcast, and share it with the people you know who binge on historical drama. 
Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters is brought to you by the Michonne Boston Group. The views and opinions expressed on historical drama with the Boston Sisters are those of the speakers and do not represent the positions or views of the Michon Boston Group, its clients or affiliates. This is Michonne Boston. And this is Tequina Boston. Thank you for listening.